Good evening uh, and welcome to the 5th David Hay Memorial Lecture. This is the first one to go virtual, so fingers crossed that it all goes off okay. Some of you will know that uh, about the Donks for the Heritage Festival, which we usually hold in May, as part of the nationally recognised local history month. Heritage Donks, to which includes Donks for Archives and local studies, as well as the museum service, is in the process of relocating. We realised quite early that it was not going to be possible to hold a full festival this year. We were, however, planning to hold one event, the David Hay Memorial Lecture, which has been part of a, a festival for the last four years. Unfortunately, with the arrival of COVID-19, even that seemed at risk, but uh, we are now able to go virtual. Since the lockdown, all sections of Heritage Doncaster have been striving to provide history at home, and we've been exploring new ways to do this. You can find more details on our website, heritagedoncaster.org.uk. You may know of David Hay, but for those who don't, in the 1970s, he was one of the few professional historians to respond in a positive way to the growing interest in family and local history. David was a highly regarded and pioneering figure in this field. He held posts of importance such as being Professor of Local and Family History at Sheffield University and President of the British Association of Local History. But he was first and foremost a Yorkshireman at heart and never forgot his roots. He was the patron of the Donston District Heritage Association and gave a talk at the 2013 Heritage Festival. He was an author of many local history books, uh, often uh, based on the South Yorkshire area. We hold copies in the local studies libraries, including The Making of South Yorkshire, Medieval South Yorkshire, The Oxford Companion to Family and Local History, all of which are very well used by both staff and customers. I'm very passionate about history in general, and particularly local history. I'm extremely proud to be Doncaster's local studies librarian. I uh, believe that our heritage and local history should be available for all to enjoy. When David passed away in February 2016, I felt that we needed to acknowledge the great debt we owed him for making local history accessible, and so the memorial lecture was established. At this point, I, I'd like to read a quote from David's obituary in The Guardian. He stated, he spoke with authority, but with humour and informality in a clear Yorkshire voice. And that is very much how I like to think and remember uh, my history hero. I want to dedicate this event not only to David, uh, but to his widow, uh, Pat, and their children, Emma and Jonathan, uh, who've always been so supportive of the lectures. And lastly, just to say that the 10th Doncaster Heritage Festival is being planned for autumn of next year, 2021, when hopefully we can all meet up again to celebrate Doncaster's heritage. So please do keep checking the website, heritagedoncaster.org.uk quick little plug. Uh, at this point I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's virtual talk. Uh, she's Sharon Bennett Connolly. Uh, Sharon grew up in South Yorkshire, uh, just a few miles away from Conisbury Castle. She writes the blog History, the interesting bits .com, uh, and is the author of some fantastic books about women in history, including Heroines of the Medieval World, Silk and the Sword, and her latest book, Ladies of Magna Carta. Today, Sharon will be talking about her research into the Warrens. Uh, these were the Earls of Surrey who held Conisbury from the Norman Conquest until the death of the last Earl in 1347. The Warrens were a family at the centre of English history for almost 300 years. Uh, it's a story of strong family loyalties, national international rivalries, rebellion, civil wars, lost loves and royal connections. It's the story of Conisbury's iconic castle. We hope you enjoy this year's talk. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, so please do let us know what you think in the comments. And Sharon has very kindly uh, agreed to answer some of your questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, I, I'm really, really pleased that Sharon has agreed to give this year's lecture, and I want to would like to hand over to Sharon now and just say thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Helen, and thanks everyone for tuning in uh, to my debut. YouTube lecture. It's a pleasure and an honour to present the David Hay Memorial Lecture this year for the Doncaster Heritage Festival. Um, I thought I would talk about the Warren Earls of Surrey and their links to Cunningsborough Castle as I've been spending the last year writing their story which should hopefully be published next year. Now if you're anything like me and grew up in South Yorkshire then you'll know the castle well You'll have visited as a child, I think practically every school in South Yorkshire did a trip to Cunningsborough Castle at some point in their curriculum. Uh, I grew up visiting the castle every summer having picnics 
and playing in the grounds, not necessarily going into the castle. Though when we did, it was almost a take your life into your own hands. If you went in before the 1990s, then you know, they didn't have floors, it didn't have a roof. And it had this really narrow walkway around the inside of the keep uh, where you had to pass very close to people and be very careful <laughs> about leaning over the edges. But it is a part of South Yorkshire's history. It's probably the most iconic building in South Yorkshire and for good reason. It's a stunning building that has been there for 800 years. Well, actually, um, 850 years, possibly now. Uh, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the people who owned it and built it and a little bit about me as well because I did actually give guided tours at Cunningsborough Castle for a time after graduating university I had nothing to do so I went to the castle and said do you need any help and they said well we could do with if you'd like to do some tours but we can't pay you so I spent about six months there giving guided tours to groups of school children uh, about three tours a day I think it was which is about all my legs could do going up and down that keep three times a day and on those narrow walkways because when I did it it was the year before English Heritage moved in and put the roof on and put the floors in it's a stunning building now and well worth a visit if you haven't been in the last 30 years it's in incredible to see the work they've done and how better preserved it is now there's no slime on the walls anymore Anyway, so yes, I used to give these guided tours and we didn't mention an awful lot about the Warren Earls in those days. We talked about the links to Ivanhoe and the fact that Sir Walter Scott drove by one day and saw the castle and thought it was the ideal setting for, the, for Ivanhoe's father's home. So yeah, um, Sir Walter Scott set Ivanhoe there, which puts Cunningsborough Castle on the map really. Um, before that, going back into legend, Geoffrey of Monmouth mentioned Cunningsborough Castle um, when he was writing his History of the Kings of Britain and he used it as the stronghold of Ambrosius Aurelianus. Uh, if you've never heard of him, Ambrosius Aurelianus is one of the candidates for the legendary King Arthur, which would be great because that would mean that Cunningsborough was Camelot. He was believed to have existed in the 5th century and fought the Saxon Hengist in battle. He defeated Hengist, captured him, brought him back to Cunisborough and beheaded him there and buried him in the grounds. There's actually a little hill in the Outer Bailey that's known as Hengist Mound uh, because that's supposedly where Hengist was buried after he was beheaded. I don't know if anyone's ever done any archaeological survey to actually see if there is a body or hengist in there to prove that it's true or not. Uh, but those were the legends that surrounded Cunisborough at the time. Its name comes from possibly Kingsborough, meaning Kingsborough, or Conansburg, which meant that the borough belonged to Conan at some point, although who Conan is, nobody has a, an inkling. So Cunisborough itself shrouded in history, shrouded in legend and what we do know is that by 1066 it belonged to a certain King Harold II. Harold came to the throne in January 1066 on the death of Edward the Confessor uh, but did not have an easy reign. He was challenged by his brother Tostig and Tostig's friend Harold Hardrada who he fought at Stamford, who Harold II fought at Stamford Bridge and defeated only to have to race back down south to face Duke William of Normandy at the Battle of Hastings. Uh, Harold wasn't as lucky that day. He lost and died in the fighting. William of Normandy became known as William the Conqueror as a result. And in his, in his entourage, in his army, was one of his distant cousins, a certain William de Warren, who was a younger son of Rodolphe. De Warren, I think that's what I've got, uh, of Varennes in Normandy. William had been fighting with his cousin Duke William for quite a few years by 1066. He had fought at the Battle of Mortimer against the French King in 1054 and was rewarded with Mortimer Castle and later the Castle of Bellencrompe 
both in Normandy, giving William his own lands, not dependent on inheritance from his father. So William came over with the Duke in 1066. He's one of the few known to have definitely been at the Battle of Hastings. He was he is one of the few names actually given by chroniclers at the time to have definitely have been present. He was rewarded after the battle with land at with the Rape of Lewis in Sussex, where he eventually built a castle and also in the 1070s founded a priory, uh, St Pancras Priory at Lewis. Uh, which he and his wife Gondrada founded after going on pilgrimage to Rome, but they never made it and ended up being diverted to Cluny, the Abbey, the great Abbey of Cluny. And after visiting there, they decided they wanted to open their own priory with Cluny monks uh, and um, set about doing that. It was the first Cluniac priory in England, although more followed. Another one was founded in Castleacre in Norfolk by William before he died and continued by his son, the second Earl. Now, we think it's likely that William was given Cunisborough sometime in or after 1068. Uh, it may well be that William joined his cousin, the Duke, and now King of England, William the Conqueror, in the harrying of the North in 1068, when William came north to put down a rebellion of northern earls and Edgar the Athling, the last of the Saxon line and we it's possible it seems likely that William de Warren was given Cunisborough in as reward for helping in this battle in this conflict having belonged to Harold II Cunisborough was became William the Conqueror's own property in 1066 and he decided he gave a, quite a bit of Harold's property to William de Warren in gratitude for his work, uh, his help over conquering England. Now Warren didn't do too much with Cunisborough from what we can tell. He did a lot with Cunisborough churches. Um, now I'm saying Cunisborough. This was called the, the Honour of Cunisborough which was all the land around Cunisborough. The honour of Cunisborough is massive. It spreads from Dinnington near in Rotherham, Sheffield area, to Thorne and Hatfield on the other side of Doncaster. So it was a vast area, Braithwell, Ravenfield, Edlington, all the areas, if you're from South Yorkshire, you know them, they belonged to the honour of Cunisborough. So it was a vast, vast holding for it to be given to William de Warren. And he gave most of the churches in the holding to Lewis Priory to finance the running of the priory that he'd founded with his wife Gundrada. Now Gundrada is also an interesting character. Uh, for a long time, for many, hundreds of years, it was believed that Gundrada was a daughter of William the Conqueror and that's why William de Warren was so amply provided for, but this does not seem to be true. It seems to have arisen from a misreading of um, a chart of the original foundation charter for Lewis Priory, or a miscopying of it more like. Uh, it seems that one monk got over enthusiastic when he copied the original foundation charter and named Gundrada as a daughter of William the Conqueror, possibly as a way of getting more funds to the Priory. Uh, being a royal foundation makes you a little bit more attractive to people. But it may have just been a genuine mistake. Monks can make those as well. So Gundrada was actually Flemish. Um, she had two brothers, Gerbod, who became Earl of Chester for a short while before returning to Flanders to look after the family lands, and Frederick, who had lands in Norfolk. Now, Frederick was murdered by Hereward the Wake, in 1071, which formed caused a feud between Hereward and William de Warren. William de Warren actually tried to ambush and murder Hereward, uh, but the tables were turned and he was the one who got knocked off his horse and stunned. Then Hereward decided to go in full-blown rebellion and William the Conqueror came and defeated him. But yeah, not one of uh, William de Warren's greatest moments, being knocked off your horse by Hereward the Wake. William de Warren basically spent his entire life fighting at war, even after 
the conquest, he always seems to have been in the thick of the fighting with Hereward the Wake. And then in 1088, under William II, he was still fighting against the rebellions against the king. Now, Gondrada had died in 1085. William the Conqueror died in 1086. Uh, William de Warren was about, must have been in his 50s by the 1080s. Uh, in 10, probably in about March or sometime around Easter 1088, William Rufus rewarded him with the Earldom of Surrey. Before that, he'd just been William de Warren, but he was 1088, he got the Earldom of Surrey. He didn't enjoy it for very long because in June of 1088, he was at the Siege of Pevensey where he was fighting against Odo, the Bishop of Bayeux, who was rebelling against William II at the time, when he was wounded during an attack on the castle. Um, he was doing the attacking. Uh, he was wounded rather badly, um, taken back to Lewis and died. He was buried at Lewis Priory alongside his wife, Gondrada, who'd been buried there three years earlier. Uh, aside to the story is a few in the eight, his body was eventually found again when they were building the railway through Lewis and he's now buried in a little church with Gondrada just at the side of the priory and you can actually see Gondrada's tomb in there and there's gorgeous stained glass windows of William and Gondrada and their bodies were found in lead lined coffins so they've been reburied. William was succeeded by his eldest son, another William, who became Earl on his father's death. He, William was probably one of the longest serving Earls ever in medieval England, let alone as a Warren, Earl of Surrey. He was Earl from 1188, 1088, sorry, to 1138. So he was Earl for 50 years. Yeah, in the first few years of William's earldom, he was fighting and supporting William II against Robert Curthose, who was Duke of Normandy and William's older brother. When the Conqueror had die, died, he left Normandy to his eldest son, Robert, and England to his second son, William II. His third son, Henry, was given money and land, uh, but the, pro the countries went to Robert and William. Now, Robert thought he got a raw deal, so he did try and wrest England from William, uh, but then decided he wanted to go on crusade. So he actually mortgaged Normandy to William so that he could get the money to go on crusade. When William then died, Robert was returning from crusade and Henry I seized the opportunity, grabbed England and started making play for Normandy. William de Warren, the second Earl of Surrey, sided with Robert Curthose. Now, this might be, you like, well, he's got land in Normandy and England. A lot of barons in those days, they couldn't decide whether to go for, to support Duke of Normandy or support King of England. William had an added incentive. He had, a few years before 1100, tried to find himself, get himself the royal bride, and he'd proposed marriage to Edith of Scotland. He was refused and told that Edith was reserved for higher things. She did live in a convent at the time, so there was a question uh, whether or not this was a more royal husband or to be a nun um, is a bit ambiguous. But in 1100, when Henry I became king, he promptly married Edith of Scotland and changed her name to Matilda. And this might be why William de Warren decided to support Robert Curthose, the Duke of Normandy, against Henry I. Unfortunately, he chose the wrong horse. Basically, Henry I was much more adept at gaining control of things and keeping control of things. He defeated Robert Curthose. Robert Curthose came over to England to try and win the crown. Um, lost, basically was outmaneuvered by Henry I and ran away to Normandy. William de Warren, the Earl of Surrey, had supported Robert Curthose and as a result Henry stripped him of his lands and um, stripped him of his lands and power. William 
went running to Robert Curto's and complained to him that he'd lost all his lands because he'd supported Robert against Henry and it was all Robert's fault. Robert apparently felt guilty and sailed to England to re to speak to Henry about giving William his lands back. Um, and Henry did it. Henry gave William his lands back. It didn't do Robert much good, but Henry William got his lands back. And from that moment on, William was more friendly towards Henry and eventually became one of his staunchest supporters and allies. He fought for Henry I at the Battle of Tanspray in 1106 and again at Bray Mule in 1116. Um, and he was alongside Henry throughout then. He was one of his most um, loyal supporters. And in 1119, William again went in search of a wife and he did have an idea, he did like the idea of royal brides and he married Elizabeth Vermandois or Isabel, Elizabeth or Isabel, she, both names, um, Isabel de Vermandois, who was a granddaughter of King Henry I of France. She was also the wife of Robert Beaumont, the Earl of Leicester. And there is some question as to whether or not he was friendly with Isabel before the death of the Earl of Leicester. In fact, some sources suggest that she, his relationship with Isabel it broke the Earl's heart and that's why he died. But he was old at the time anyway. Isabel had been married to him at a very young age. She was 11 when she was married to Leicester and he was in his 30s. Um, so it was very, not a very um, equal match. She'd already had about nine children when her first husband died and then the reason there was a suggestion of scandal is that they married very quickly after the Earl's death. Within about three months they were, Isabel and William were married but that doesn't mean that they did actually have an affair before the Earl's death. It just means that Isabel was quite clever in knowing that she would be an attractive bride and needed to get married quickly to protect her own interests and found a suitable husband in William de Warren. The couple had a number of children including um, their eldest son William the third Earl who was born the year after the marriage in 1119. Now Isabel had a number of children with her first husband including twin boys, her eldest sons were twin boys Waller and, and Robert de Beaumont who were big players during the anarchy the time between when Stephen and Matilda fought for the throne and they were also very close to their half-brother William de Warren. Uh, when the second Earl was at Henry I's deathbed in 1135 he had with him his two ste oldest stepsons Waller and, and Robert and his, young, and his own oldest son William and they escorted Henry's body after his death to Rouen to be sent, transported to England for burial at Reading Abbey. Uh, the Earl died in 1138 and was succeeded by his son, the third Earl, who was only 19 at the time, but he had, as I say, he had two very um, protective older brothers who looked after him. He didn't have a great reputation even when he became Earl. Uh, he didn't have a great military reputation. He'd already been known for running away from Normandy when Stephen was campaigning in Normandy. He was Young William was one of the young lords who decided to head back to England rather than continue the campaign. And then 11, for, in 1141, when he was still only 21, 22, actually he was probably about 21, he... Um, was at the Battle of Lincoln with Stephen in February 1141 with Stephen and with his older brother Walleran and they fought, they were fighting in the Battle of Lincoln. Unfortunately the wing that William and Walleran were a part of uh, broke and fled um, after Matilda's army advanced and um, so William and his brothers left the field leaving Stephen fighting with his centre which was just some Welsh levies and Lincoln uh, 
yeah, the Lincoln Fjord, as they'd call it, and some, and his own household knights. And Stephen was actually captured in the battle. His sword broke. He was surrounded, hit on the head with a stone, and ended up having to surrender. But at least he didn't flee the field. William de Warren then actually redeemed himself that summer in 1141 by capturing Robert of Gloucester, Matilda's half-brother and senior military commander, which gave the Royalists, under Stephen's Royalist friends, the chance to swap Robert of Gloucester for Stephen so that they could get Stephen back on the throne. Now, the anarchy went on for some time and um, a lot of the nobles tired of it. In 1147, William and his older brother Walloran decided they had had enough of that kind of fighting and joined the Second Crusade with their cousin, Louis VII of France. Isabel Walloran and William's mother was the grandson of King Henry I, so, and so was Louis VII. So they were first cousins and William and Walloran decided they would join the Second Crusade. By this time, William had a daughter, Isabel, who was cannot have been much more than 10 or 12 years old and um, before he went on crusade he decided to arrange affairs so that Isabel was married to King Stephen's youngest son William of Blois sorry I am useless at pronouncing Blois uh, I try my best and it's unusual because I can actually speak French but I cannot pronounce Blois so William married his daughter to Stephen's son William and went, departed on crusade and never came home. He was killed at the Battle of Mount Cadmus, um, fighting in the rear guard of Louis' army. And uh, so the Eldon went to Isabel as for fourth countess and to William Stevenson as the Earl. Now, William was Earl f until 1159. He seems to have been the most unambitious young man you could come across. He was only a teenager to be fair, but he doesn't seem to have kicked up much of a fuss when he was disinherited basically by his father, King Stephen, who agreed to pass the throne to Mat Empress Matilda's son, Henry, in order to end the anarchy and the conflict that had ravaged England for about 19 years. William was amply compensated to be fair. He was given all his father's original lands in the county of Mortain and his mother's lands in Boulogne as well as the vast Warren earldom. At this time, just to go back to the Warren earldom, you had Cunisborough in South Yorkshire, you had Wakefield, the second earl had been given Wakefield, the lands in Lewis in Sussex and the massive lands around Castle Acre in Norfolk which had originally belonged to Gundrada's brother Frederick, who'd been murdered by Hereward the Wake. So they had three very s substantial areas and minor areas also. They had Kimbolton, Rygate. Um, so, yeah, they had something like at the time of the 1086 Doomsday Survey, William the First Earl, <coughs> excuse me, was the fourth richest man in the country after the king. So they were, it was, for William of Blois, it was quite a substantial uh, inheritance that he was going to gain, even if he wasn't going to get the crown. But he didn't have long to enjoy it. He died in 1159, so only 10 years after becoming Earl, 11 years after becoming Earl, and only five years after Henry II acceded to the throne. Isabel given all the lands she had, was um, too rich to be allowed to stay single and Henry tried to find her a suitable husband who would stay loyal to him. Uh, the first option was his brother William, but uh, do you, the Thomas Beckett opposed the match because William had been was first cousin to Isabel's first husband, so it wasn't... He, he opposed it and um, so Henry looked around for someone else and Henry chose his half-brother Hamelin Plantagenet, Hamelin de Turenne, 
who was the son of Geoffrey of Anjou, Henry's brother, Henry's father, by um, an un unknown woman. But Hamelin was loyal. His motto was pro legge per legge, for the for the law by the law, and he was very loyal to his younger brother, Henry the Second. So he was married to Isabel de Warren in 1164. He stayed, as I say, loyal to his bro brother Henry II. He supported Henry during his sons, the rebellion of Henry's sons, Henry, Richard and Geoffrey in 1173. He escorted his niece Joan, or Joanna, Henry's daughter, to her marriage in Sicily. And in between 1170 and 1180, he built the magnificent keep at Cunisborough Castle. It was built on a larger scale than one he'd already built at Mortimer in Normandy. And one we think he also built at um, Peel Castle at Thorne in, on the other side of Doncaster. From what we can tell from, I mean, there's nothing left of it now but the hill, but from what we can tell from what was written about the castle, at Thorn, it was very. It was a three-sided rather than the hexagonal shape of Cunningsborough Castle, but it was built on very similar design but smaller. So Hamelin built Cunningsborough Castle. Uh, he and Isabel spent more time in Yorkshire than any of the previous earls. They seem to have made it their home, and indeed one of his daughters, Ella, married um, a knight from Scr Sprotborough. Uh, Richard Fitzwilliam from Sprotborough. So it sort of suggests that they were really close to the area and they um, spent a lot of time here. Now there was a scandal during Hamlin's time that um, may have soured his feelings for his, ne his nephew uh, Prince John and then King John. Um, sometime in the 1190s, probably the early 1190s, John either seduced or had an affair with one of Hamlin's daughters and the result was a son named Richard, after King Richard. Um, uh, the result was a son named Richard, who um, is Richard of Chillum. He fought in the 1217 Battle of Sandwich, um, but in Hamelin, it sort of explains why Hamelin didn't support John during King Richard's reign and there may have been quite a bit of frost between the two. Although John did visit Cunisborough in 1201 when he was king and when Hamelin was there, he uh, issued a few charters from Cunisborough Castle and I always think it's nice when I go into Cunisborough Castle and look in the have a walk into the chapel and think that King John probably was in there one day during 1201. He did only stay one night though. So, but and I'm not sure how much he actually bothered about being at church, but it is nice being in the chapel and thinking how 800 years ago King John probably visited there. So Hamelin died in 1202 and was succeeded by his son William. They do like a lot of Williams. This is William the fifth Earl and probably and the fifth Earl named William as well. Um, I need to mention the Earl numbering here because in some books, William the fifth Earl is named William the sixth Earl. And this comes from the fact that Hamelin and the earlier William of Blois were both the husbands of Isabel. Isabel was the fourth Countess. And it was her, it was in her name. So her husbands could both be named as the fourth earl. But in some books, they're named as the fourth and fifth earl. So from this moment on, William the fifth earl could be William the fifth or William the sixth earl. As Hamelin was either the fourth or the fifth earl. So I've decided to count Isabel as the fourth. So William, her son, is the fifth. Now, William was involved heavily in the Magna Carta crisis. He tried to solve some of the issues against King John in 1214 and 1215. And he was one of the guarantors for King John uh, with the papacy when, they made, when John made peace with the papacy in, before the Magna Carta crisis. 
John had had an argument with the Pope over who should be Archbishop of Canterbury. He disapproved of Stephen Langton and was excommunicated in 1207 with the whole country put under interdict. And it was only when John finally gave in and four earls, including William de Warren, um, stood surety for John, the peace was restored. And then up comes the Magna Carta crisis when the barons decided that John had gone too far in trampling all over their privileges. William was himself one of the witnesses to Magna Carta on John's side in 1215. By 1216, however, he, Prince Louis had been invited to invade from France and claim the throne. Um, things looked desperate for John and all looked lost and William decided to jump ship and join the side of the rebels and Prince Louis. Probably in order to preserve his own lands, he could see where things were going. He could see that John was going to lose, so he decided now was the time to make a play for, to look after himself first. Uh, luckily for John, he died, which I know it doesn't sound that luckily for John, but luckily for England, let's put it that way. Luckily for England, John died in October 1216 and was succeeded by his nine-year-old son, Henry, who was... Um, supported by the great William Marshall. He was made Henry's regent and um, a lot of the barons came back to Henry's side at that time. William came back in March 1217 and helped to secure peace against the French in, 12, in summer of 1217. He um, was part he made um he was part of the negotiations with Prince Louis that meant that Prince Louis was given ten thousand pounds to go home and leave England to the English sort of thing. Now as to Cunningsborough, it is likely that William the Fifth Earl was the one who built the curtain wall and the buildings the now lost stone buildings inside the inner bailey. They seem to, if you've ever been to Cunningsborough Castle, you know that the design is slightly different from the keep's um, design. The keep is very perpendicular, very hexagonal, and the walls, the buttresses are very and nicely cornered, whereas the curtain wall is rounded. So it was definitely built at a later date and probably by the 5th Earl shortly after he became Earl in the early 1200s. The fifth Earl married Will, uh, Matilda Marshall, William Marshall, the Earl of Pembroke, regent of Henry III's daughter, and had a son, John, and a daughter, Isabel. But he died in 1240 when his son, John, was still only uh, nine, eight or nine years old. Uh, his daughter Isabel is a fascinating character. She's brilliant. She Henry the Third um, tried to claim some land in Ingoldsthorpe that suppo was supposed to belong to Isabel, and instead of just having it, just agreeing to it, Isabel decided that she'd take on the king and tell him she wanted her land back. Um, she was so persistent and so forthright, apparently, that Henry III wrote a letter saying, give her her land back and she can have it, so long as she doesn't tell me off again. So that's a little thing about Isabel. I liked Isabel. Uh, John was the sixth Earl. And um, he is a fascinating character. He's one of these... Um, doesn't sound like a very nice man, to be fair and neither were his those people working for him there were people of Cunningsborough actually appealed to the king under John's tenure because um his constable was his constables were taking um, massive privileges stealing wives horses and wool from residents of Cunningsborough so they actually appealed to the king against him he's also accused of murder um, he was a uh, he was a soldier. His entire career was as a soldier, and he was a soldier right until the very end. He had there was this great time, this um, inquiry 
by Edward I called the Quo Voronto, another thing I can't pronounce, Quo Voronto Proceedings, which is where every baron had to prove his right to his land. And they were supposed to bring pieces of paper and say, look, these are the deeds to my lands. And John brought a sword, apparently. There's only one source that says John brought a sword. But John brought a sword um, and he drew this rusty sword um, in front of the, the clerks and said um, something like, this is my proof of my land. My ancestors came over with William the Conqueror and we won this land by the sword. Which is, it just, that is just so John the Warren. <laughs> he, he was, like I say, he was a soldier. He's, he was made guardian of Scotland at, um, after the fall of John Balliol. His daughter was actually married to John Balliol, um, Isabella, but we don't know if she was ever Queen of Scotland. Um, she may have died before John was made king. But when John fell, it was John Balliol lost his throne. Um, John de Warren was made guardian of Scotland for Edward I. Unfortunately, he was the one meant had to face William Wallace and he was defeated by Wallace at the Battle of Falkirk. Although he didn't then, no, scrap that. He was defeated by Wallace at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. And then was in the winning army that defeated Wallace himself themselves at the Battle of Falkirk. Got my armies the wrong way around. He was married. Um, the royal connections for the Warrens run right the way through the earldom because John was married to Henry III's half-sister, Alice de Lusignan. Um, they had several children, including a son, William. Unfortunately, William was killed in, in a tournament in 1286, um, either before or shortly after his son was born. There's some sources say that his, his son was born first and he died, and others say he died and then his son was born. So he had a son named John, who succeeded his grandfather as Earl in 1304. Now, John is the last Earl. John had a big problem. He was married to Edward I's granddaughter, Joan of Bar. Unfortunately, he was 20 and Joan was 10. And he had to wait for Joan to grow up. And he didn't want to wait for Joan to grow up. So he got his own girlfriend, Maud de Nerford, and had children by her and spent the rest of his time trying to divorce his wife. He also had a private feud with Thomas of Lancaster, which didn't help things either. He um, kidnapped... Thomas of Lancaster was Edward II's cousin, and he was one of Edward II's um, greatest opponents. So William... Sorry, John de Warren actually kidnapped Thomas of Lancaster's wife, Alice, at one point. Um, whether he did this with Alice's consent or not, we don't know. But Thomas then retaliated... He didn't really like his wife, but he still retaliated and he attacked Cunningsborough Castle. Um, it's the only time, as far as we know, that Cunningsborough Castle came under any form of military attack and it wasn't a very good one. There were apparently six or eight people in the castle at the time. Uh, three brothers, the Great Head brothers, and a miller. So... Thomas didn't actually come up with any great resistance and the castle fell into Lancaster's hands and was only returned to John de Warren about 10, 12 years afterwards. As I say, John had um, wife problems. Well, Joan actually sounds lovely, unfortunately. Um, she does sound like she was a really nice lady and a very practical lady and everybody liked her. Edward III's wife and mother both liked Joan. Uh, it's just John that didn't and he did everything he could to try and get out of the marriage. He claimed that they were too closely related. He claimed that, oh, Maud Nerford, his girlfriend, claimed that she and John had been married beforehand, before he'd married Joan, so that his marriage to Joan was invalid. Um, none of these arguments worked. Uh, John, he even claimed that he couldn't be married to Joan because he'd had an affair with Joan's aunt, Mary, who was actually a nun. Um, 
But the courts wouldn't listen to him and he was ordered to return to his wife. And he did. He and Joan never did get divorced. They did remain married. Um, when he died in 1347, that meant that there was no son to succeed him. He and Joan had never had children. So they, um, the earldom passed with John. The earldom was passed to John's sister's son, Richard Fitzalan. And Cunisborough was passed to the crown, to Edward III, who then gave it to his fourth, fourth son, Edmund of Langley, who was later named Duke of York. And it was at Cunisborough that Edmund Langley's youngest son, Richard, was born, Richard of Cunisborough, Earl of Cambridge. Unfortunately, he came to a sticky end when he was executed for his part in the Southampton plot. Um, but that's it. 1347 was the end of the Warren Earls of Surrey and the end of the Warrens owning Cunisborough Castle. Uh, they, despite the fact that John didn't have any legitimate children with Joan, he did have a number of illegitimate children and there are many Warren descendants throughout the country and beyond. I know a number of people from America and Australia who are descendants of the Warrens from John and earlier Warrens. I went to school with somebody called Warren, Paul and Sarah. So I wonder if they're descended. We'll have to see. Anyway, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope I haven't waffled on too much. Uh, look out, please, if you're interested, look out for my book next year. It should be around this time next year. It's been published by Pen and Sword. If you have any questions, I will be around to answer them for the next few hours. So um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, if you don't want to get in touch tonight, I have a Facebook page, History of the Interesting Bits, and a blog, History of the Interesting Bits. So please um, get in touch. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. Bye.